It's interesting. I find that kind of with a lot of filmmakers is they start off and their films are so vibrant because they're not encumbered by the technology. And then as they go on and they get bigger yeah. and they climb, it, it, that sort of takes some of the, not all the time, but that sort of takes some of the energy away. Which, by the way, has a direct parallel to the music we were just speaking of. Remember that era? This was the late 80s, early 90s, the bands that you're referencing. Parsa, um, Game Face, Smile, yes. yeah. So think about what Headphones. was happening musically at that time. You had the rise of all the hair metal bands in the Sunset Strip uh, zone uh, coming forth in the mid to late 80s. Uh, everything had to be, you know, uh, you know, big Tommy Lee drums and, you know, the big hair and the big ripping weedly, weedly, weedly solos, you know, and music had sort of lost its soul. And then all of a sudden these bands come along with this sort of fresh spirit and this great new sound, at least it was to me, and simultaneous to that, up in Seattle, something similar was happening, you know, with Tad and, and Mud Honey and, and some of those bands. And so the fusion of sounds that you got between those two scenes um, sort of blew the old uh, scenesters out of the water because it was fresh and it was original and it was real. It wasn't contrived. And so that's what pumped me up was hearing people doing something original, not just copying the same old shit that they heard on the radio. Is there anything that you remember about recording Rochambeau? You know, it's been a while, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's why... I, I just wondering. remember being super jazzed about the people, because for me, literally half the fun of all these years and, and you know, musical memories is the people, it's the relationships. You know, when athletes retire from their sport and... Hey, what are you going to miss? The crowds, you know, the adulation. No, they say, I'm going to miss the camaraderie. I'm going to miss, you know, hanging out in the locker room. And for me, it was those times uh, with Mike and the rest of the guys sitting here just shooting the shit and goofing around. And yeah, we had to make some music too. But I mean, it was those interpersonal relationships. You know, I just heard from Todd, Trout, Game yeah. Face, yeah. and Wall uh, just a couple of days ago. In fact, I don't know if that's how you and I got yeah. reconnected. But, yeah. Um, and it all came flooding back when we were on the phone. But, uh, to me, when it comes to Rochambeau or, or Good or, or any of the albums that you're referencing, mostly what I remember is the good times. And yeah, there's some awesome music in there as well. But as far as technically, do I remember you know, how we cut the drum? No, I don't remember like which microphones we used or any of that. I just remember having a really, really good time with those guys. What about working with a band like Sensefield? Same thing. Super dedicated, super... Uh, craftsman, uh, remember the guitar player in that band ended up forming two other bands at the same time. Yeah, Rodney. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the singer was, from the moment he opened his mouth, you could tell he was something special. He was one of those guys that used to make his own little concoction every day. You know, a lot of singers are a little superstitious. You know, you can't uh, uh, eat pasta, you know, six hours before you sing. And, you know, so he had this green uh, veggie drink he would whip up uh, before each uh, uh, session to get himself, you know, in the right place. Uh, by the way, one quick note about Mike on the Rochambeau sessions that I just recall now as I'm thinking about this. Um, again, just another example of what I remember more than the technical aspects. One night I come home probably two or three in the morning and there's a voicemail on my phone. I don't answer the phones here, so everything gets forwarded to the home. I always loved your message because you would tell people what you were doing yeah. on your message. Yeah, I had to because oftentimes, you know, musicians be musicians, they would forget, oh, am I in today? So they would call me, hey, are we in tonight or tomorrow? <laughs> and so I started saying, well, okay, so this is the game phase Tuesday. Just so if somebody called, they would understand, oh, it's, it's our night. We better be there. Um, in fact, it's funny. One time I bought a phone. Uh, pretty high tech for the era where based on the caller ID, you could personalize messages for whoever <laughs> called you and freak people out. Cause I'd say, Hey Jeff, uh, by the way, when you come in tonight, can you make sure? And Jeff listen, he's fuck, oh, man. He goes, that's some freaking technology there. He was all agog, but I love it. anyways, I see this voicemail and I push play and it's Mike Popeye. And he just, when the beep happened, he sang me start to finish note. Perfect. Some seventies, schlocky pop ballad and then hung up and i thought it was the sweetest thing in the world that was awesome i wish i could remember what song i was That's but yeah he on. decided to call me and just sing me a three minute pop ballad how so that's what i remember how do you come 
to work with Greg Ginn. Be That's a good one. That's a really good one. Okay. Because I mean, so, he's a legend, and you were doing that. And I, I the one thing I remember you telling me just just from years ago was that working with him, there was just it was almost like you guys were on like a odyssey, like a voyage together. You we would were. come in and. But how does how does that relationship happen? Yeah, let me just kind of uh, share with you uh, some of the highlights, and then you can edit them for uh, time and clarity. But. Uh, before I knew him personally, uh, he had an assistant, his sort of man in the field, a guy named Rich Ford. And Rich was the guy who was out doing uh, the sort of the A&R work, if you will, for SST Records. So uh, he had brought me probably a Bad Brains record, I'm thinking, that was recorded live, maybe Fender's Ballroom. And there were a lot of technical issues with the recording and uh, they didn't know what to do. So uh, yeah, I remember we had to work on the song, The Youth Are Getting Restless was the song. And we were trying to fix the drum sound at one point, uh, not HR, but who was the, uh, the guitar player? Um, there's Daryl. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. There's... Thank Dr. No. Yeah. Uh, his guitar had come unplugged <laughs> in the middle of the song, and then he plugs it back in, and we were trying to get the sound from. Anyways, a lot of technical issues. So we did a couple Bad Brains records, did an HR record, um, uh, uh, Meat Puppets. Oh, yeah, it was Meat Puppets. So that's what happened. The Meat Puppets recorded here, and that was kind of a fun thing because uh they drive because kurt had been in an airplane he crashed five thousand feet and the only thing that saved his life was uh they fell in the snow oh, wow. in the snow wow. walked away but he refused to fly after that so he would drive everywhere they, in fact they had a full-time driver so they drive eight hours from phoenix or wherever it is that they're from and uh, they walk in the back door after eight hours and kurt looks and goes oh man he goes i forgot my amp how many amps I can borrow? I'm like, dude, did you leave the water running too? Like, <laughs> how, do, how does that work? Anyway, so we do this Meat Puppets record, and Kurt, or I'm sorry, Greg, heard it, and it had kind of a different sound to it, and he liked it. So he, he called me, hey, this is Greg. And I don't know if you have ever seen interviews with Greg, but, you know, on stage, he's a, you know, maniacal, energetic performer. By the way, speaking of that, you just mimic the pics. When he finally came in here, uh, Literally, dude, he had a bag, a bag of picks like this. And I said, dude, I go, like, lifetime supply? Like, I was <laughs> kind of goofing on the bag of picks. He's like, oh, no. And he's very serious. You know, off stage, he's very quiet. And, you no, know, he goes, that'll last me about a week. A week? What are you talking about? And he says, I hit him pretty hard. Oh, really? So then I started watching him. And sort of, and he's like, like a machine, you know, on this on these strums and then like halfway not even halfway like first verse he'd throw the pick away and he'd quick pick up a second pick and just get right back at it and this would happen several times through the song and i would at the end of the song i picked him up and i kind of go they're all serrated edges they were ground down he really played hard i remember uh, i think it was kurt uh who played with uh, a quarter or a shilling oh, or something wow, remember some wow. of those guys zz topper Brent. but i remember kurt from the puppets i think played uh, pesos or something 